Um, before we begin, I would like to invite uh, the Reverend Dr. George Parsenios, the Dean of Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, uh, the institution that's co-hosting uh, this event to offer a greeting. Father George, the floor is yours. I'd like to first congratulate my colleague, Father Eugene Pentiuk. Uh, we're all delighted to uh, uh, have for ourselves to read his wonderful new book, Hearing the Scriptures. Uh, and it's a wonderful gift to uh, all of us who uh, have already started to read it. We're just equally glad that others have recognized its value and that he is being honored with an event like the one this evening. Because uh, uh, actually it's not only an honor to him, but it's an honor to our whole school. So as we congratulate him, we would also like Father Stephanos to thank you uh, for arranging such a wonderful event, as, uh, as well as the Institute for the Study of Eastern Christianity at the Catholic University of America. We are grateful to you all for putting on this event and we are delighted to co-host it with you. Uh, let me also welcome uh, the representatives of the faculty and the student body at Holy Cross who are here online with me. Uh, welcome to everyone and Father Stephanos again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father George. And for those on Zoom, obviously because we have a technical issue, later on if you want to pose a question, please type it in in the chat and then I will read it out and uh, Father Eugene will answer that question. Um, so the Institute uh, is very happy to host a book presentation and panel discussion on Father Eugene Pentiuk's new book titled Hearing the Scriptures, the Turgical Exegesis of the Old Testament in Byzantine Orthodox Hymnography, published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Father Eugene Pentiuk is an accomplished scholar of Old Testament and Semitic languages and an Orthodox priest. He, hold a he holds a THD from the University of Bucharest and a PhD from Harvard University. He is the Archbishop Dimitrios Professor of Biblical Studies and Christian Origins and Professor of Old Testament Semitic Languages at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts author of six monographs, among which the Old Testament and Eastern Orthodox Tradition, published in 2014 from Oxford University Press, and editor of the Orthodox Handbook of the Bible in Orthodox Christianity, forthcoming this year also from, Orthodox, uh, from Oxford University Press. Father Eugene is currently working on a new book under contract, also with or Oxford University Press, um, titled Reading the Hebrew Bible, an Orthodox Biblical Theology in Conversation with the Anaphora of St. Basil. Finally, I would like to note that today's lecture is co-sponsored by Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology by the students of the liturgical studies and biblical studies areas of uh, our university here and by the School of uh, Re Theology and Religious Studies. I would like to thank the Dean of the School of Theology and Religious Studies, Father Mark Morozovic, the Dean of Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, Father George Parsenios, Christopher O'Brien, doctoral student in liturgy, and Jonathan Riley, doctoral student in biblical studies for making this event a reality. And I'd also like to thank the panelists who will engage with uh, Father Eugene Pentiuk, Samuel Moss, Father Michael Keeler, Kevin Fritz, and Jessica Rentz from Liturgy, and Jonathan Riley and Philip Moore from Biblical Studies. We are joined by faculty and students at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology via Zoom, as well as local Orthodox clergy. And we are looking forward to more such opportunities that strengthen the relationship between the Catholic University of America and Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you so much, Father Stephanos and Father George Parsenos for beautiful words that you spoke about me. I don't know if I'm deserving these words. 
but <clears throat> and it's kind of difficult situation for me to speak about my book. You know, I prefer something a conversation, like a panel discussion, than speaking about my book. So I was thinking how to present my book. So what should I say about my book? I started. You have to know, long time ago, my scriptural studies back in Jerusalem at the Colby Bleak, where I studied and the great professors at that time, archaeology and biblical exegesis. I studied the Orthodox theology and Bible, Bucharest University and Orthodox theology, dogmatics and so forth. I came to the States and actually I was not so pleased to see people dissecting the verses in three for sources at Harvard University, and I changed immediately to the comparative Semitics. And actually, I, with the grace of God, I reconstructed a dialect, the dialect, the Emirate dialect of Akkadian language, which was published by in the series of research of Harvard University at the time. Then I continued being a professor at the seminary with biblical studies, especially on Hosea, on patristic annotations, and then being involved at the Col Biblique in a great project. And I'd like you to, to take a look at this project is the Bible in its traditions. And I work as a team leader on a project Hosea and was published by Peter's Press in 2017. Then uh, the people took me like an expert now in the history of reception of the Bible. Uh, that doesn't have too much to do with my work, my previous work. And uh, like Father Stefano said, uh, last books of Vox of Press were like this, Old Testament and Eastern Orthodox tradition. Now this hearing the scripture, again, Byzantine hymnography. Another project, again, was like Father Stefano said about the... Um, uh, upcoming um, uh, handbook, Oxford handbook, a Bible and Orthodox Christianity. And then I have a project that I go back now to my first love, which means uh, mythic philology, Hebrew Bible, reading the Hebrew Bible, and trying to see the continuities and discontinuities actually between the Hebrew Bible rhetorical approach intense type of work on Hebrew Bible and what the orthodoxy has to offer. In my opinion, the Sam Basil, actually Anna Pura is probably one of the best examples, probably better than the Creed. Why? Because it starts with that own, the one who is, and that is Exodus chapter 3. 14. So, uh, so please excuse me if I don't know many things or I will not be able actually to respond to your questions. I'm not a liturgist. I learned so much from this man, Father Stephanos, and from another friend of mine at Regensburg University, Father Harold Buchinger, who is the big shot that I know. But I don't know so much about liturgical studies. Uh, I don't know so much about the hymnography. This is a labor of love. Why I'm saying it's labor of love, this book? Because I became a Christian, if I can say like a good Protestant. I'm not a Protestant, but if I can say like a good Protestant, I was born again. I remember even now when a beautiful evening in a springtime, I was the age of 14, coming out from the Deni, we say the Denia and Slavic word for these matin services during the Holy Week. And I was like having the impression that Jesus is everywhere because in that church, Jesus was everywhere in hearing him and seeing him in a beautiful iconography and so forth. So I said, I have to write something about these hymns because as a priest, I recite them, I chant them during the Holy Week, but I want to understand you know, what, what this tapestry is about because it's so convoluted this stuff. So I wanted to see the Bible and the hymns. And I was going actually methodologically speaking, I was going for those hymns who didn't show any Bible use. So I was going word by word using the Bible works because students are asking me, oh, what, what kind of research you did. So I was using the Bible works. So now him like Monday, I was blessed by God to find an expression which is used only once in the entire Septuagint. And that is the etasmas kemistagas, 
the trials and the scourges. And is an him speaking about the passion of Christ. But this expression is used only in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, verse 37, referring actually to Antioch, the fourth Epiphanes, the persecutors of the Jews. And the, one of the children said there, one day God will bring on you tyrant, will bring all the trials and the scourges, and you realize that God has the last word. So interesting, for me, was just a revelation. But the one that I discovered this, and I said, wow, these liturgists knew the Bible and knew it very, very well. If they resorted to a phrase encountered only one time in the Bible, and then they converted to this typology, I call it in my book, a converted typology, because they use this for Jesus who assumed Accept it is katadekome, which means accept it utterly, entirely. All these trials and scourges for our salvation. So he's moving now from Antiochus, who was punished by God with these trials and scourges to recognize that he is the supreme master, now to Jesus, who accepted benevolently, you know, the trials and the scourges. So then starting with this kind of observation, I said, I have to write a book, you know, about the hymns. Nobody now in these liturgical studies are probably interested in lexical and biblical analysis, more on historical, like I discussed with Father Stephanus, the liturgical studies are more focusing on diachronism than on synchronism to see what it happens at that level. And I was very interested in true intertextuality, which means between a corpus and a different other corpus. So, um, so this was actually, it's a, a labor of love. Uh, I have to stop here. I cannot go now and just produce other books. <laughs> history of reception. I like to go now to study the themes, the theological themes, because Orthodox and Catholics don't have so many theo theological books for the Old Testament, but for the New Testament. We prefer the systematic theology in Orthodoxy and uh, Catholicism. I'll say a few, 10 probably good books in the, uh, in the Catholic uh, faith and tradition uh, on this uh, theology of the Old Testament. But we don't have any book actually in the Orthodoxy. So let me now, so what I'm going to do today, <laughs> I try to, oh, it's good. This is my book with a nice illumination from the Psalter of Paris, Jonah, and says it all, speaks volumes, even this little icon, about the simultaneity and multi-angularity of what we, I call in my book, liturgical exegesis versus patristic exegesis. Another reason actually why I, I wrote this book is that I noticed when I did the research and wrote the other book in 2014, the Old Testament and Eastern Orthodox tradition, that we are so close, Orthodox and Catholics, we are so close. I said, what, what, what can I bring something new <laughs> to the plate when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, exegesis or hermeneutics, we use a more fancy word and so forth. So I said, probably the Byzantines are, right now, if I look to the Second Council, <laughs> Vatican Council of the Liturgy of the Catholic Church, I would say that the Byzantines were still good and so-called liturgical exegesis versus, and not necessarily versus, because versus means like in contrast or whatever, but in comparison, if you like, with the patristic commentaries. Because I used a lot in my Hosea book. Uh, for the first time, I did some translations were not even done in the modern language at that time in 2000 when I published my Hosea book. So I said, I like to see if there's some differences or some similarities, of course, between the patristic writers and the liturgies, they're all under the same umbrella of the church fathers, church mothers. Yes, but I said, I'd like to see if there is something else, because when I read the commentary, patristic commentary, always I know from the very beginning what that author is going for. Like Cyril of Alexandria, he will discover Christ everywhere in the Old Testament, because that was the theme of his days, the Christology. So it's very, how to say, agenda-triggered, 
if you like, Li linearity, so you cannot do too much. Uh, they don't change these commentaries. And very interesting, I discovered that the patristic commentators or like uh, library rats right now. They are staying in those little secluded libraries and monasteries and actually having codices. That was a luxury to have a codex, a book from cover to cover. And that's why the linearity of this, uh, um, I say, procedure and the patristic commentaries. With the liturgies, they didn't probably have the codices. They have collections, liturgical collections, no? Octoiehus, uh, Prophetologion, the Psalter. Uh, so having collections, they have like a deconstructed Bible. And I use here in the chapter seven of my book that Jacques Derrida, the construction and reconstruction in a nice way. I mean, inventing and reinventing. You see, you don't, you cannot change a patristic commentary. You know, I mean, if you're a scribe, you just copy it and copy it again. But with the liturgical texts, at least the liturgists told me, there are so many variants and so many actually revisions of this text. So it's something different that that compact type of commentary that you find among the church fathers. But let's, let's all go now for the time, for the sake of time uh, to go to what I said here. So here in the scripture has two parts. So the first part, long part is lexical, biblical, theological <laughs> analysis. And then the <clears throat> probably the chapter, more original chapter in my book is this seven chapter, key features and hermeneutic procedures of liturgical exegesis. I wanted to make a point, the liturgical exegesis or interpretation, sometimes uh, I should probably use interpretation rather than exegesis, but still I think that at the liturgical level, they are doing a little bit of exegetical work. They are more, more uh, they don't have the agenda. I see in those patristic commentaries having an agenda and it's kind of like interpretation. You force the text to speak towards that agenda where you have a team in your mind, Christology, Mariology, Ecclesiology, and you have actually to demonstrate that everything is in the scripture. With the liturgies, we have something else. It's like the could be start. The hearer has a role in interpretation. You see, you, you don't have a big role in interpretation when you read a commentary by, uh, by a church father, because he will give you Point by point, line by line, I will not use verse by verse because they didn't have the division of verses at that time. But you know, it's, it goes like from one point to another, sequential. And what we have here, more work I need to, to, to make probably in this kind of uh, hymnography, you have like a synthesis, I'll call like a precursor of biblical theology. I will not go like systematic theology, but kind of like biblical theology. But you here, you are invited actually into this game to reconstruct the mind of that uh, hymnographer, what you want it actually to say. It's not that easy, you know, you don't find the gist, you don't find the team immediately reading uh, a hymn or just looking at an icon if you like, okay? So this is actually my interest, uh, and this is a little bit of originality, if I like, I mean, people who criticize me, of course, analogy of lit liturgical exegesis that could be start. I remember having my discussions with my good friend, Olivier Thomas Venard, he's the vice president of the Ecole Biblique, an atomist scholar, and he actually wrote a nice dissertation published, made a presentation not Notre Dame two years ago, on the poetics of Thomas Aguinas, something very new. So it's kind of, he's an artist in his own right, an uh, artist too. So I said, uh, I talked to him and he, he said that it's a good analogy. Michael Coogan, my professor, one of my professors, doesn't have anything to do with the history of interpretation. He's more like a Belhausen type of guy. He said he's a brilliant one. So I take it like a good compliment, but uh, let's see if it plays all right with you guys here, okay? So I would suggest the following analogy, discursive interpretation. 
which is the patristic commentaries, analogous to Renaissance or pre-Cubist or naturist art, whatever you call it, and then the liturgical exegesis analogous to the Cubist art. Um, so I want actually to, to jump here to a few slides again to show you the six points of not the divergence, but just a contrast or the similarity between the what we call the patristic interpretation and the liturgical exegesis. Uh, and uh, these are the six points that I found at the end of my research. Uh, everything which is in yellow belongs actually to liturgical exegesis and white to discursive patristic. So you have imaginative and discursive. Yeah, and it's true. If you look to the patristic commentaries, they're very discursive, like a debate, you know, the author speaks to himself or to herself and actually tries to get the best through argumentation and reasoning. And then you have synthetic, this is, of course, the hymns. It's a kind of synthetic, if you like, exegesis. It's very close to the biblical theology, again, I insist. And then you have the analytical stuff, those word by word, like in the word commentaries in the scripture, if you like. And then simultaneous and multi-angular. I mean, it, the liturgy in itself, I remember Robert Taft, God bless his soul, he said it very well, that everything in liturgy is simultaneity. You know, you look to something, uh, like, for example, the holy table and the altar. Now, what is that? Is the sacrificial table? Yes, but then could be the tomb of Christ. So there are many things that uh, are offered to you simultaneously. And multi-angularity, yes, it takes a, a theme and just a snip, snippet of the Bible, the scripture from one place to another. So that is multi-angularity. And you are left alone to, do, to, to tie the dots, if you like, or, or just to, to be there. But it's so, so much liberty given to the, uh, to the hearer or reader. Facilitative, you know, it facilitates, doesn't impose on you. You know, and I have a term that I use here, or a phrase rather, hermeneutical pointers. It gives you a pointer there and says, now it's a term, my friend, <laughs> here to the hymn, to, to, to go a step further, if you like, with this interpretation. A prescriptive, yes, commentaries are very prescriptive. You know from the very beginning what is the agenda. You can know a little bit about that century. When you place the patristic writer, you know immediately what. Uh, he is talking in his commentary, you know, is the Mariology, is Christology, is the Ecclesiology, whatever theme was uh, fashionable at that time. Multimedia, here is very important because what we have in that, uh, that commentary is a text somebody reads because illiteracy was so high level at that time, you know, for you. Uh, but here is multimedia, you hear it. You know, you don't need even to learn to, to read the text. You hear it in the church and you see it at the same time, oral, visual. You know, that is very, very important. And that was actually my testimony that I brought to you, that I was converted in a way to my Orthodox faith because of that kind of multimedia. Go to church and the taste of Eucharist and everything is just, just on senses. It touches your senses. You, you are almost corrupted in a good way <laughs> if you go to an Orthodox church and you are open minded and you don't have anything, you know, prejudices before. So this is multimedia, oral, visual, and textual. And then popular and global. It's almost like the internet today, the hymnography. I say all the time, with all the media that we have, St. John Chrysostom liturgy, if you like me to say what defines me as an Orthodox priest, is that piece of spiritual entertainment. It's great to see the liturgy having so much popularity when you have all this media, you know? You have the internet, you have the Facebook, you have everything. But when I go to John Chrysostom liturgy and attend it, it's a perfect, it's a masterpiece, if you like, a spiritual entertainment. So that is popular, global, open to everybody. Now, with these guys learned limited in access, you have to be very learned to write a commentary like this. And like I said, limited in access, 
Some libraries probably contain their manuscripts, but the liturgy is every little church here or in a village in my native country and so forth. So it's very global. Uh, deconstructed, reconstructed, like I said, it's kind of reinventing the stuff and, uh, and they are privileged. You see, Byzantine hymnographers are privileged by the fact that the Bible was already deconstructed. <laughs> For them, I would say, in these collections. So if you don't have a long text, you then do the best you can by pieces that you have. So you have the, like I said, Psalter, Prophetologian, Octetoic, and so forth. So um, I call the use of the scriptures in liturgical setting the new context. I'll call it the liturgized Bible. One of my friends is Professor Sam Vladimir, wrote an article a long time ago, and then he went away from this kind of characterization that the, these texts, the hymns, are written Bible. I wouldn't go that far because the written Bible, it's very linear. You know, you take the Jubilees, for example, and just like retelling you the story from Genesis and Exodus and what we have here, it's not a written Bible. The pieces of scripture here and then, this ocean that I call Byzantine uh, uh, liturgy. And here also I created a little bit of uh, imaginative, um, if you like, drawing. I imagine a hymn like a literary galaxy warped by various planets, rare words, apax legomena, they like this stuff, fragmentary codes, all this revolving around the central star, the hymns gist or main theme, which is hidden from us. We don't know. You, you are asked actually to find it, that gem, the theme. Some of the hymns are obvious, they are very clear, but some of other, others, they are so convoluted that you don't know what, what they were want, wanted these guys to tell you. <laughs> okay, so it's a tapestry with different orbits, again, different levels of understanding, you know, if you are having, like me, the Bible works, I go there, and just like Sherlock Holmes, I find the expression, you know, in Second Maccabees, if, um, I, if I'm not so versatile in the Bible, actually, I go in a different orbit. So there are different levels of understanding. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is actually the liturgical hermeneutics, irreducibly multifaceted richness of liturgical interpretation is what we have in these uh, hymns. So look at what is the analogy with the Kubist art. The Kubism actually, who started the beginning of the 20th century, the great Cubist artists, you know, that we know, painters, because it's in every, every sector of uh, the artistic life, literature, painting, and architecture, but Pablo Picasso, Georges Braque, for me, is uh, probably one of the most decisive uh, guys among the Cubists, and one uh, Greece, and started with Demoiselle de Avignon. You see, they already, they keep a little bit of naturalism, you know, on some faces or whatever, but then they geometrize everything or they cubify everything and give you the hints, but leaves you, you know, to be part of the interpretive process. Um, and then you have the Renaissance art, which actually the Renaissance artists wanted to reproduce, I'll separate the words even, reproduce the reality, but from that, on own angle, okay? So you don't have so much to say there because they give you like a copy without any post-production, I would say, intervention there. And this is the realism that the pre cubist paintings might look their illusionists. You know, they try to represent the perspective, all of this linear, dimming some objects if they're far away. But you notice now that it's not reality, it's just an illusion they create for you. So paradoxically for me, the copists actually are more realistic than the, the painters uh, preceding this uh, period and the history of art. And Domenico Viniziano, you see here in Annunciation, you see the, the kind of perspective that I'm speaking, it's just uh, hilarious, it's just, uh, it's not there, <laughs> it's just an illusion. Um, so what do we have here? And with the, uh, the patristic interpretation, the linearity, sequentiality and movement, argumentation and reasoning, and full focus on a theme that the author wanted actually to insist on. It's very easy to predict where they are going in their um, commentaries. 
But this kind of uh, exposition description is hardly consonant, I say here, with the real nature of God's word, which can be reduced to a particular pericope or text under the microscope being analyzed by an assiduous ancient interpreter eager to find some hidden meaning in the text. Everyone wants actually in uh, ancient times to find some hidden meaning because they started to that kind of presupposition or assumption that the scripture is cryptic and they are the deciphers of the meaning. But you know, it's more, more on, on, on the patristic side than on, on the hymnographic side. Okay, so this is multi-angularity and simultaneity. It's encountered in Byzantine hymnography uh, and is analogous to the Cubist art in the liturgical, uh, in the, excuse me, in the uh, patristic is more linear. And um, here you find again the marriage of virgin, like I try to say that they, they try to represent, to reproduce the reality, but you see that is Ill illusory. And um, what I try to say also, when I'm looking to the two ways of doing exegesis, the discursive way separates the text from interpretation. So this is the commentary, even today, if we see in the PG and PL or whatever you go to these tomes, you know, patristic commentaries, you see the text, a little bit of text, the pericope, and then the commentary by that certain father. And this started actually in the medieval times with what we call glossa ordinaria, now it's ninth century, 12th century, uh, especially in the West, but we have also some uh, stuff in the East. And you see here in the middle, um, big frontispiece there, the text surrounded by catena, by uh, excerpts from different fathers of the church. Uh, here we have in the East, something similar to glossa ordinaria. Are usually the psalters or marginal catene. Here it's actually 12th century of Tateuch, a collection of liturgical uh, texts of the, coming from the first eight books of the Old Testament. And you see the text is just uh, written differently. You know, the surrounding uh, comments from the fathers is Genesis 49, 22. Uh, one of the best examples, I would say, are the Psalters, you know, with the marginal notes. And this is the, Psal the Theodore Psalter, 11th century. Or you have the text, the text is from Psalm 45, uh, speaking about uh, this in the patristic commentaries is referring like a foreshadowing of Theotokos. Even in our liturgical service, you use a passage from Psalm 45 when we prepare the gifts for the liturgy at the service of Proscomidi. And we say the Empress stood at the right side of the emperor. And we have a piece of bread, like a triangle, just in, uh, in honor of Lady Teotokos. And this is the text from Psalm, but you see on the margin, you have Lady Teotokos, Mary, surround, <coughs> flanked by Archangel Gabriel and King David. So how in the world? I mean, who read this text this way? But we learn it because there was a commentary actually done around the 11th century, a commentary um, from Athanasius, 4th century, but was reproduced in a 11th century Catena manuscript, which was preserved actually in a copy in 17th century. And Athanasius says like this, this phrase in Psalm 45, uh, verse 10 relates to the Virgin Mary and foreshadows her annunciation by the Archangel Gabriel. David addresses the Virgin as his daughter because she was born from his seed and after him. What I try to say here is that the commentators in Glossa Ordinaria, in a word later one in uh, the, the manuscripts they, that we have on Patricia Commentaris, are separating the text, they analyze from their interpretation. It's not like in a hymn. In a hymn, you have the text interwoven with the interpretation. This is almost impossible to uh, separate them. 
Okay, so that is, uh, uh, I find an interesting uh, difference. And George Brack here, this cubist painting looks like bi-dimensional, you know, but look at in the center, you have a glass and that glass has that kind of sensation that is solid. You have the impression that you, you can grasp it. So this is what I wanted to say that the Renaissance painters, the pre-Cubist painters, paradoxically, they wanted to reproduce the reality, but their reality was a kind of illusion. Now with the Cubist art, the reality becomes more sensational or feeling like because they use these cubifying and geometrizing techniques. The same with the hymns, you know, and the hymns, because you have these kind of orbits that I was talking, you know, then you, the, the hymn has volume. It's not just a simple interpretation and saying like this, the three visitors at Abraham, like Cyril would say, they represent the Holy Trinity. It's kind of very, for me, it's very flat. And uh, it's not, but let me continue. Just I know the time is up. Uh, what in the hymnog what I find in hymnography is that kind of interweaving the text and the interpretation. And I would say that the precursor probably would be the Targumic way. And also the homiletic way of today, at least for our tradition, if I like to sermonize the gospel, I, I, I recite probably the first verse or the verse that I'm interested in, and then I intercalate my own interpretations. So it's almost targumic. You see the targum I used the Hosea because I was so much working on Hosea. The, what you see, the white is just the translation in Aramaic done by the targumist and everything in Elo. It's a kind of interpretation, but intercalated in the text itself. So this is, I find, uh, similar to what happens in the... And the key, I insisted on this on overall um, the visual, I want to go a little bit here, the integration. The integration is interesting uh, feature of the so-called liturgical exegesis. I can have on a hymn what I call the augment, augmented gospel. Uh, the gospel which is made of the gospel itself, some hints, the gospels, plus the messianic texts. So look at what happens here in the hymn, circling the dogs. You have a word, I just uh, put it in parentheses, eroton, questioning. So Jesus was questioned, you know, in front of uh, 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 the high priest. And, but we don't have such a thing in the gospel. And the gospel is saying that the high priest or the priest or whatever, they wanted to have false witnesses to testify against him, but they were not asking anything actually. Uh, so Eroton is uh, like the, the messianic or the Old Testament text is bringing a new nuance, if you like. And it's not what we find, for example, in the patristic commentaries you'll find like this, prophecy in fulfillment, kind of vertical, type of diagram, which is almost a superstitionist way of looking to the Old Testament. Old Testament is here, Christ came, he fulfilled everything, so this is antiquated type of corpus that we have in the Old Testament. It's not the case in the hymns, and the hymns both are treated on a par, on equally, you know, and they are brought together in a synthetic way. So this I find fantastic, you know, because it's not so much superstitionism. Is here it's like, oh, you guys in the Old Testament, you have something to say to what the gospel says? Okay, we'll bring you here, and then we have a better picture. We have a fuller picture. Okay, so this is the one. I like only one point to make because I know that I am uh, of the time here. Um, What is this stuff? I don't know. Ah, the spruits, no, the spruits. This is one I wanted. Hermeneutical pointers. Because in the Cubist art, the artists are using to give more feeling of reality, they use the technique of collage or collet, papier collet. They, they put some stuff they like, for example, and this I give this example here, you know, by Picasso. 
La Bouteille de Suze, you know, it's just a bottle of alcohol. And he wanted actually to render the atmosphere of a cafe, of a Parisian cafe, where the people are coming, the artists are drinking, and they're reading newspapers. So and actually, he glued some newspaper here and then put a little etiquette or label on the, on the, on the bottle um, to, to give you that feeling of reality that you are in a cafe. The same happens with the hymnographers um, uh, using just some hints. And I give you that example of the second Maccabees chapter 737. And it's up to you now. It's like quizzing. For me, it's like these guys were so probably so learned in the scriptures and they wanted to quiz the people coming to church. Why they put that kind of phrase, which is encountered only one time, is Hapax Legomena, to be like a hermeneutical pointer, to say like this. Some Jews were suffering at the hands of pagans, Antioch the fourth. Now a new Jew, Jesus Christ, is suffering at the hands of Pilate, another foreigner. And one was punished and the other one accepted, you know, willfully, like Jesus Christ, all these trials and scourges. Thank you very much. So, um... <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Father Pentiuk, for this wonderful presentation, um, giving us an eye, uh, a pathway, if you will, into how liturgy um, in the liturgical hymns, how, how not only the Old Testament is used, but it's presented, and the various ways of interpreting these hymns. Um, right now, uh, we go into our second part of, uh, of our presentation, where uh, uh, both the liturgy students and uh, scriptural students from our doctoral programs or graduate st studies will uh, address Father Pentiuk and pose to him a question or questions, and then Father Pentiuk will respond. And we'll begin with uh, Samuel Moss. Just give me a second here, I wanna. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Um, so I have basically two related questions, um, particularly related to the analogy of your uh, cubist art. Uh, the, the fundamental part of the question is how literally you want us to uh, apply this analogy. Um, so I ask because uh, you describe the counterexamples of uh, precubist art and biblical exegesis as discursive, linear, and sequential. Um, but if you think about like dimensionality or dimensions, uh, like one dimensional imagery that just refers to like lines or line segments, those are one dimensional. Uh, two dimensional imagery is, you know, uh, length and height, and three dimensional is length, height, and depth. Um, so if you apply the analogy, um, I guess, uh, directly, precubist heart would actually be not linear because the precubist heart is two-dimensional. Um, so I understand that the, the general premise is that the hymnographer's work is more complex. Um, so with that in mind, um, how literally would you like us to apply this analogy? And related to that, um, would you say that then since the work of the hymnographers is more complex, like a three-dimensional thing is more complex than two-dimensional. Would you say that the hymnographer's work owes its origin to or evolves from the work of biblical exegesis? Thank you. Questions, actually. And um, you, first you asked me if uh, how far we go with this uh, analogy or in general or analogies. I would say, just look at the Jesus, uh, parables because they're analogies. We don't have to take them literally, you know, and we go as far as we can. And um, this is the best that I found, uh, better than that analogy with the rewritten Bible. 
Uh, second, to respond to the linearity, I don't take it here in a dimensional way, but rather in a procedural way, how the interpreters, you know, patristic interpreters are going with the discourse, words by words, in a linear way, from the beginning of the book of Genesis till the book of, to the end of Genesis. So I'm not so much into that. And this responds to your question that we don't have to take it too literally, you know, this kind of analogies. And, uh, of course, the last question is very important uh, because all actually are, like I said, affiliated to the church and consider them the church fathers or mothers. There are many, many mothers, actually. One, I remember that they called Biblic, was the empress, actually, who built the church, Saint Etienne, Saint Stephen in 439, Byzantine empress, actually, who wrote comments on scripture, too. So we have mothers of church, church not only Fathers. I would say that I, I hate the word contrast even. They are not in contradiction. It's a complementarity. And what I try to suggest here is that the hymnography is more flexible, more creative, more imaginative. And I'm telling you why. I have friends of mine in my native country, probably the best iconographers. I go and visit them, you know, and they know more theology sometimes than priests. Why? Because they are conversing all the time with theologians and priests because they know how they, they, they should know or they have to learn how to represent all these figures of the Old Testament, New Testament, on the frescoes and so forth. They are theologians, but they are primarily poets or artists, these guys, I would say. So the same with the hymnographers. They are first poets, artists. They don't have big hats to go and participate in uh, councils of the church. You understand to be always afraid, don't say anything wrong, be political correct or something. So they are more flexible in the interpretation of the Bible than uh, the thought, like let's say Cyril of Alexandria or somebody participating in a council of the church, which has actually to play that kind of political game, whatever political game was at the time. But they are more artists but they are well learned, you know, in theology. Like I give you this example of the iconographers in Romania. They are like uh, graduates of theological studies and they are not. But I think Thank that's you. it. Uh, the next question or comment will be by Father Michael Keeler, also from Liturgy. In the meantime, if I can ask uh, Jonathan, uh, Riley, who's on Zoom, since you can't present your question live because of technical issues, please email me your question and I will uh, present it. Uh, thank you, Father Pendiuk, again for a great presentation and uh, enjoyed uh, reading the book. There's one um, hymn that kind of uh, stuck out to me in your analysis of it and um, it's the uh, Apostacon hymn for um, uh, the uh, Good Friday, so it would have been celebrated um, on Holy Saturday, uh, if I'm getting my timeline right. Um, and there's an interesting line in there you talk about, um, uh, it's, it's uh, Joseph of Arimathea swing, uh, singing to the, the dead Christ, and he says, Ami, O sweetest Jesus, when the sun just a little earlier beheld you hanging on the cross, it wrapped itself in darkness. And um, you talk about this word uh, darkness in the Greek, Zophon, and um, how it's a, you call it an odd, unnatural darkness, um, and then draw some interesting parallels. You call it the place of damnation reserved for recalcitrant angels. Um, there's some interesting uh, parallel texts. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, those parallel texts, maybe talk about um, this idea of Zophon, uh, this, um, this realm of darkness. Um, and especially as it relates drawing out the theology, of course, of Christ's descent uh, to the underworld and what that has to offer for us. So, yeah, so forth. And this, I like, I wanted to make a point before, but right now, uh, you know what I discovered with these hymnographers, their predilection for very rare words rare words, hapax legomena will be, will be probably the, the food they will eat every day. Why? Because that was the, the, one of the assumptions of the ancient interpreters is that God is the primus auctor, God is the first author. And if he inspired the waters, 
even they believe in a septuagint being inspired, then those words which are very rare are charged with a lot of theology and they insisted on these words. You know, I saw that predilection for rare words. And one of these words is Zophos actually. It's encountered like up to 1,500 times Homer and all, all this Hesiod and all, all this kind of Greek ancient classical literature. Um, uh, the word Zophos appears only four times, if I don't mistake, mistake now in, uh, in the New Testament and Hebrews appears like uh, something good because that was the darkness, the deep darkness that Moses had the conversation with God. But in the rest of the text, like Jude chapter, uh, chapter verse six and then uh, 14, if you don't remember, I remember correctly. Uh, in Peter also, Zophos is uh, referring to the angels abandoning their ranks, like Jude says, and being um, chastised, being punished, uh, thrown into the Zophos, into dark, into the kind of like blackness, probably will be so, or nether darkness, something like this. And this hymn that you quoted, you find something very nice, is the, sun, is the light which now vested itself in Zophos in deep darkness. What brings me actually to Genesis 1, 2 and Genesis 1, 3. It's a big jump because in Genesis 1, 2, we have a mess there, tohu vavohu. It was deep, it was water, it was the darkness, scotosis is there, you know? And then comes God and says, let there be light. But now you see like a reverse of creation. When Jesus dies on the cross, now the light disappears in what? In Genesis 1, 2. So it's like returning to the tohu vavohu, to the primordial chaos. So it's fantastic. And in Enoch actually is another text actually where Zophos is used for Hades, like in Greek literature, Homer uses for the, uh, again, for, for the netherworld, you know, ambience. Thank you, Father. Um, the next question. Is. Uh, from uh, uh, liturgy student uh, Kevin Fritz. Um, I don't see the PowerPoint. Oh, here it is. Um, Kevin Fritz from uh, uh, the liturgy area. Father, thank you for having us. So I have I have a mostly a comment, but a, a bit also of a question. I think. Um, so first, allow me to read the hymn in the translation that you have. This is the Kontakian for, for um, Holy Saturday Matins, which is uh, first heard on Friday night uh, as the Matins is served by anticipation. And then it is also heard again Saturday night at the Paschal Nocturnes just before um, Matins, Paschal Matins. The one who shut the abyss is seen dead and wrapped in myrrh and shroud, laid down in a tomb is the immortal as a mortal one. The women came to anoint him with myrrh to wail bitterly and cry aloud. And this is what they are crying aloud. This Sabbath is the most blessed one on which Christ having fallen asleep shall rise again on the third day. So there were a couple of points that I wanted to just sort of comment on here. One is that uh, this hymn will be heard, the context of this liturgically is that this hymn would be heard while the icon of the shroud is in the center of the church. Um, so the development of this as well as 
um, of the procession with the shroud at that at that first service, the Holy Saturday Matins begins. Uh, it, it develops beginning in the 10th century, initially as the gospel, the book of the gospels, the four gospels is uh, brought in. So initially it is a functional gesture. The gospels have to be brought in in order to be read. But then there is an intertextuality that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, that is perceived where obviously the gospels are also an icon of Christ's presence, right? So this, and then the, the gospels will be covered with the ayir, which is the covering of the holy gifts, which has uh, this uh, icon of the deposition from the cross uh, embroidered upon it. And so this entrance with the gospel, with the icon of the deposition from the cross, the icon and the entrance develop over time. There is sort of a intertextual back and forth uh, until it is a much larger icon and it is taken in a long procession around the church. And in some locales, it's even in the streets. And so the icon of Christ's presence is there's a simultaneity of liturgy as you spoke about, right? You see it, this, the hymn says he is seen dead iconically and therefore literally he is seen dead. This is also heard at least in the Slavic churches. This is not true in the Greek church where the shroud will be taken up into the altar during the liturgy on Saturday morning. But in the Slavic churches, it remains in the center of the church up until the, uh, the canon of nocturnes. So the hymn will be heard again, and he is still seen. So initially, it's heard as anticipation of the procession. Then it is heard again in anticipation of the shroud being taken up into the altar and the first cries right the people are waiting in the church for the first cries of christ is risen so there is quite a bit of simultaneity as you said an iconic uh, gospel the question uh, finally that i wanted to turn to is you talk about when when talking about this the abyss again going back to creation the uh tohu ve bohu and you talk about this, so this is, uh, this is an icon of creation. The one who lies dead is the one who shut up the abyss in the, be in the beginning. But perhaps there is also some uh, another level here, maybe where, because, because he is, when he is lying dead, he is shutting up the abyss because he is going into the abyss, right? He is descending into... Hades into the abyss and shutting it up by his action of dying. So maybe there is a simultaneity of not only creation in the beginning, but maybe right creation now. I just was wondering what you thought of that. Good observation because you uh, one uh, another hymn actually it's on saturday because what you present here is the transition is very interesting this transition from good friday to saturday which we call in our tradition the first resurrection the liturgy of saint basil in the morning which is truly the first resurrection then comes the second resurrection the midnight and so forth but the transition is so quick so sudden and it's actually immortalized, if I can say immortalized, <laughs> in this piece of artistry uh, that you see we do not spend so much time on the tomb. Like in the Western tradition, you see even the resurrection is like Christus Victor, you know, sitting on his own uh, tomb with the victory, the sign of victory, the cross. In the Orthodox tradition, the emphasis is more on entombment. I mean, take not even entombment, probably taking down from the cross and going to that kind of death 
So the, the, the concentration is on death. And another hymn now on Saturday, because it's recreation now, it's another simultaneity. Uh, it says like this, that um, Hades was embittered, seeing you as a tetomenon, brothon. Now, brothon, brothos means, it's very word, very rare word too, means mortal being not anthropos. So it's like a deified mortal. That is the contrast of all contrast. And see, I see here the contrast going to death and immediately uh, with the actions and some like the OCA and the Greek church, different probably moments in time, but uh, that kind of resurrection is coming. But it's a very sudden, quick transition from taking down from the cross we don't do so much on taking down from the cross and the eastern right, but it's the epitaphios which takes now place to show us that he is dead, but the day fight dead, and the, the Hades doesn't have any power on it. So that I, I think that this, this represents the day fight cross more than any other. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite now Jessica Renz, also from the liturgy area, to pose her question. Thank you, Father. That was uh, very informative and really helpful for, um, especially at the beginning of your book, which uh, wasn't really talked about, but you described the whole services of Holy Week. And um, I think it's helpful for those who are part of the church and those who aren't. So thank you. What I wanted to focus on, uh, which actually works with what you were just talking about, was, so I'm very interested in the Holy Saturday service. It's one of my favorite services of Holy Week, um, particularly because the service describes a lot of things that are going on that aren't necessarily recorded in the Gospels, as you point out. So um, we have Christ's burial, and then we have this hymnography that is about what is going on at this time, um, and really the lamenting that's occurring. And one thing I just, so my, I have more comments than actually questions. So one thing I wanted to mention too, um, that's really important is Father Schmemann of Blessed Memory talks about our theology is revealed in the liturgy. And this is what you are really talking about a lot in your book. And that um, with the cubist um, imagery that you use, it's pulling from a lot of areas to help build our theology. So the hymn that I really um, focused on was Hades Defeated, which is on Holy Saturday at the Vesperal Service. And it says, today, Hades groaning cried out, it would have been profitable for me if I had not received the one born of Mary beneath in, in, into my house. For while coming upon me, he destroyed my power, shattered the bronze gates, and being God, he resurrected the souls which I had been which I had previously had in possession. And what's important, as you point out, is that it alludes to a lot of scripture from wisdom, from Sirach, the Psalms, Isaiah, Matthew, just to name a few. And what I find is so interesting is that um, this dialogue is created during the service to describe the burial. Um, it points out that Hades recognizes Mary, that she is significant in this. Um, and then recognizing that compared to the crucifixion where Jesus is more silent and um, all of that, where it says he suddenly came upon me, which you describe the word he uses, it's a very hostile, like coming upon him and destroying him. Um, so I thought this was just a very um, great uh, description and really helping us to understand and describe what is actually going on in these services and where the actual hymnography comes from. So thank you. Thank you very much for your great comments and uh, remarks. Uh, if I may add here something going back to the word and is related to these hymns on Saturday that is used about Jesus like the mortal being, not anthropos. We have that expression from Daniel chapter 7, 14, which speaks about somebody, somebody like having the physiognomy or the aspect of a human being. I know uh, Septuagint translates it uh, conventionally, I would say, uh, he was to Antropo. Jesus came now in the Gospels, and that was the 
preferable actually uh, title that Jesus uh, was assuming to himself, saying the son of man will come. But, uh, you know, as a Semitic philologist, now I went a little bit deeper than uh, the translation done by the Septuagint Anthropos. Jesus was not only a man among men, and Jesus didn't say about himself, I am uh, a man and I came to save the lost one. He wanted probably to say something else, which is hidden actually, and that Aramaic Enosh. Uh, Enosh is also in Hebrew, you find it in Psalm 8, what is a human being that you got, you remem uh, remember him and so forth. But Enosh, now like I'm speaking like a Semitic philologist, is going back to a Semitic root that you find it a little bit, probably one time, if not about the sick little child in the Old Testament was dying uh, in Eshum, in Akkadian, which means to be uh, feeble, to be weak, to be mortal. So this I insist, even in Jesus, the Messianic Hebrew Bible, and I insist even in my classes, guys, that is a convenient translation that you find that the Septuagint is the anthropo. Jesus wanted to say something else, that he identifies himself with our weakness and our awareness that we are mortal. Human species is the only species which actually we know that we're going to die one day. And that kind of identity of Jesus' mortality, nobody from Hollywood, from Boston, from Washington, D.C., from any village will say, oh, Jesus doesn't, doesn't count me. No, no, no. We all die. And Jesus actually said, I came to save you from death because I identify myself with a mortal one. And that word brought us Again, you find it in the hymns, it means mortal human being, not simply like anthropos human being. So that is just a, a phenomenal paradox, a deified mortal human being. And uh, like you said, uh, Jessica, uh, that is the gist actually, the hymns on the Saturday, you know? And here, if I may add something else, one of my colleagues, uh, Father Maximus Constance, Nicholas Constance, I recommend this article for everyone to read it. It's called The Divine Deception, The Last Temptation of Satan. And actually says like this, that Holy Fathers of the Church in their interpretation would say that the serpent deceived us us, so we lost the eternity in a way, and now Jesus came to deceive the, the serpent, and that is actually the gist of many hymns on Holy Saturday in our tradition, that's why the serpent or the Hades personified said, why did I receive this mortal human being, because look at, he's, he's full of bruises, he's spotted with bruises, like Isaiah chapter 53, 5, but is, is deified and still full of action. And that is the word we use there, full of action. This is something interesting. So you see, God and his justice saved us through the same means that the deceiver uh, deceived us. So that kind of like Jesus never shows, especially in Mark, his identity. Even the demons came to him and said, oh, you are like this. He just didn't say a word. I am the son of the most high. No, 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 no. You don't have to, to know it. You'll know it, but that will be too late when I'm going to go to your realm. Thank you very much, Father. <laughs> Um, the next uh, question is from uh, Jonathan Riley of uh, Biblical Studies. He's via Zoom, but unfortunately, um, uh, because of technical issues, he cannot himself present the question. He sent me the question, and I will read it to you. A few years ago, I went to a conference where a Jewish scholar commented the Jews still refer back to ancient Jewish interpretation to do modern biblical studies, but that this is not the case with early Christianity. I have thought about this comment ever since, looking for ways in which ancient Christian interpretation can help us read the Bible today. I think this book helps, us, helps answer this question. As you pointed out in your book, the liturgy sometimes bring together elements from parts of the Bible 
that are widely separated from each other, helping us to make connections between parts of the Bible we might never make otherwise. One of these is the relationship between Eve hearing the feet of God walking in the garden and the woman who washed Jesus' feet. I never would have thought of this, but this is an interesting and useful connection that will be worth exploring. The same can be said of their combining of the sinful woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee in Capernaum with a woman in the house of Simon the leper in Bethany and connecting these to Mary Magdalene outside Jesus' empty doom in Jerusalem. We might not think to connect these things at first, but this is an interesting and useful connection for scholars today. Yahweh wrapped in clouds from Psalms compared to Jesus wrapped in a cloth while washing the feet in John is another such, con such connection. Some people might object that using an apax legomenon to connect two texts as you do is illegitimate because these rare words are easier to find using computer technology and would not have been heard by people in antiquity. However, I did a long-term experiment on this some years ago, listening to the whole Old Testament in Hebrew to see if I could make connections like this without a computer. And I found it is easy to do if you're listening to the text. This suggests that people would have made these connections in antiquity as they listened to the text. In your opinion, would it be useful to flesh out the intertextual examples between parts of the Bible pointed out in the liturgy into longer studies, or will they not bear more scrutiny? Um, Jonathan, thank you very, very much for your insightful comments. And you just touched one of the points that I had in my presentation, but I didn't have the time. It's called, uh, called Kronos Topos, the continuum. After Einstein, we speak about the uh, space-time continuum. And that is, you find it actually in the hymnography, the space-time continuum, when actually characters are moving from past to future, from present, if you like, liturgical present, back to past. We have the case of Jonah. It's very interesting. It says in the hymn that you, Jonah, you are my type. It's like Jesus speaking, you know, about Jonah. That is the type of Jesus that we find in patristic commentaries. But the hymnographer goes even further and says, in you, Jonah, you address now the guards of the tomb of Jesus. It's like Jonah being transposed now with the tomb of Jesus and says, guys, what you are watching now, this guy one day, the third day, you will come again back to life. So you are in vain watching him. So you see uh, another example of uh, typology, if you like, in the New Testament, you find Moses and Elijah no, like being brought in the scene of transfiguration from the past in the, in the time of Jesus. But here you find Lady Teotokos being transposed in the fiery furnace or just being there with the three youths actually and save them. So this is like chronostopos in both directions. And you don't find actually in that kind of full prophecy fulfillment uh, scheme and the patristic commentaries, but only in human so I consider that very, very, very interesting stuff. I would say to your last part, the typology, if I understood correctly, what was the question? Because the typology, the question. please, if you can. In please. your opinion, would it be useful to flesh out the intertextual examples between parts of the Bible pointed out in the liturgy into longer studies, or will they not bear more scrutiny? Yeah, I'll say go, go for it. Because <laughs> it just it just what I try to do here is like showing to the people there is another mode of doing, you know, so-called pre-critical. Some people will come with this idea, pre-critical, like you guys in the past, you didn't study the Bible that we studied now. I would say the hymnographers are so good, like my good Jewish friends now when they come to SBL and they quote the scripture like this in Hebrew, the hymnographers, they did what they did with the Septuagint. So uh, it's, an, and also something like what I try in all my life 
studying the dealing with the Bible and these pre-critical interpretations. You need them both, I would say. You need the Midrash. I am in love with the Midrashim because I like a surgical type of exegesis. They go minutely to different aspects of that word that are probably not uh, caught by the Christian interpreters. Christian interpreters are good in giving you the scopus, the big picture, starting with Irenaeus, with that economy, Soteria, the economy, the plan of salvation is like showing you, this is what God intends from you guys, if I read the scripture. Now, the Midrashists, actually, they are saying, you need also the details. So we are here to point the details for you. It's a kind of detailed type of interpretation, but you need them both. It's kind of complementary. You need them both. You need the big picture, the scopus, but you need also that little midrash, that search, intense search for a word. And one, one example to give it just because I'm working on a new project. When God created uh, Eve, you know, when, when he wanted actually to create Eve, he said, I will make for you to the humanity, he addresses this to anthropos that was not segmented, no genders probably involved, but not distinction and said, I'll make a help for you, Kenegdo. I studied that Kenegdo and people translate different ways. Robert Alter has like co-partner and Kakamaka stuff like this. I use Kakamaka something because they're not so serious stuff. Or just in front of you, or even Septuagint has katafton to sweeten the relationship according to you, man, to bring you the coffee. You know, <laughs> to serve you in <laughs> because that was the first century before Christ. But you know, I found the Midrashim, an interesting interpretation, which validates what I wanted to say. Ne Neged means something in front of you, but we say in French, vis a vis on the other side of the road. So there is this distance between male and female actually to be overcome in a marital relationship. And also means in opposition. And here was the Midrashist that he noticed immediately and said, created a story and said like this, in a village there were two rabbis. One rabbi had a good woman, a good wife, left him alone like Rabbi Akiba to study the Torah for 21 years or whatever. Another rabbi didn't have a woman who understood his love for Torah. So this is actually like an opposition, dialogical role of the woman you know, in relationship with man. Because in dialogue, you can have conflicts too, and bickering is not a monologue. So that, but the Midrashists knew how to take it into account. So that's why I say you need dog, both, Jonathan. So, thank you. Thank you, Father Eugene. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, Philip Moore also for Biblical Studies. Uh, thank you again, Father. Um, in the interest of time, I won't uh, say all of the comments that came to my mind as I was reading your work. It's really wonderful. I really appreciated the hermeneutical pointers. And I, uh, maybe somebody, have, some have criticized you for this uh, um, comparison to Cubist art, but actually that I thought reinforced it. The idea of having a wine bottle and sticking the label of the wine there, reorienting the way you're looking at the picture, very much similar to the experience of listening to something and hearing that scriptural key. And then suddenly illumination happens. I just thought that idea of like the the, the rare words and, and as guidelines was extremely helpful. Um, with what Jonathan brought up, I, I think there will be a lot of pushback on that. Uh, especially if they're so rare um, or if they're extremely stereotyped, like trials and scourges, those kind of go together and they might be collocations. So you're going to have some cognitive linguists on you like, well, maybe that's just an idiom and not so much uh, a, an illusion or something like that. But, but I think if you, can, if you can pull in more from that hymn pointing to this second Maccabean thing, then, then it's just part of, it's just one um, part of the puzzle that, that is really illuminating and really interesting. Um, the, the, what you have said about intertextualities in, in, in the book, not so much in the presentation, you talked about the narrow and broad. Um, I, I, I guess maybe as a, maybe a little bit of a pushback or a, a qualification, I think that maybe because as you say, with the Derrida stuff, the Bible is in collections 
maybe it's already in different corpora for the hymnographers. Maybe they don't have, like you kind of said, they don't have Bible as corpus, right? Corpus is sort of arbitrary. Could be one book, could be five books, could be what the Psalms, like their own corpus. So, so because corpus is a little bit arbitrary, it strikes me that maybe that's not a key distinction between the patristic discursive exegesis and the hymnographer. Yeah. What might be, I think maybe what came to my mind in, in your discussion there was genre, more than difference of corpus, but difference in genre being so starkly different. That was what kind of made the hymnography um, so much different from, from the patristic exegesis that you were contrasting it with. So just maybe thinking through that a little bit more with us could be helpful. And um, I'm gonna skip through um, the stuff on typology, which was wonderful, and just kind of say that I think um, you, you drew a distinction between like a New Testament typology where Jesus is the key to the Old Testament, right? Versus what you're seeing maybe in the hymns where Jesus is, uh, rather salvation history is the key to Jesus, right? That you kind of, I'm, I think those are really similar and probably uh, definitely in the mind of the New Testament writers and maybe in the mind of the hymnographers, there wasn't a big distinction there. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I do like here. I just touch that kind of Julia Kristeva distinction between the narrow intestuality, which you call the inner biblical exegesis, you know, like Bible interprets itself, and then the true or genuine intertextuality, which she says that is that between two different corpora. But you're right, it's probably not the best. Uh, comparison or contrasting, you know, the patristic, you know, and hymnographic uh, exegesis, because both they use the Bible and they have a genre where they can be posi positioning themselves, you know, and here the liturgical genre, yes, it's, uh, I, I, I think that it would be correct to say this way, that the way that I said it, but like I, like I said, you know, analogies are always to be worked out better and better. Uh, and of course, the typologies, I was scratching on the surface. Um, being so infatuated with this chronostopos that you find more flexibility in moving the characters than in the patristic, or the, that kind of scheme like prophecy and fulfillment is so uh, overcoming, it's dominating. Uh, here you see the people going back. It's like, uh, like I said, in the furnace was Mary, and then immediately it's called the embedded, I called it the embedded typology because it's Mary in the furnace, uh, being with the three youths, and then out of Mary, out of the, the womb of Mary, is coming Jesus. So how can you call this kind of typology? It's like I'm an embedded or whatever, but it's just in the beginning, like I said. And when I when I took this project and I applied for uh, to be admitted to the great guild of the Oxford University Press, I was making a research on Google. I said all the time to the students, do a research like I did one day long. I put in the quotation marks, liturgical exegesis, and I didn't find anything at that time because it was 2003. It was actually at Otto, Otto probably, a Catholic actually scholar doing this with the book of Acts, you know, and trying to find the book of Acts out it plays and hymnography. So uh, don't get me wrong, I'm just uh, vulnerable <laughs> as much as I can in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Let me see if we have any questions in the chat. Uh, no. So what I would suggest is ask whether we have any questions uh, from uh, uh, those physically here. Uh, Father Peter. Father, thank you so much. It's a, it's a masterpiece of a book. I mean, I have to admit I've only read the, the beginning and the end, but what I've read so far is just, just amazing. I have a question that I think some, some of us who know the situation in our Eastern churches might consider to be a question from La La Land, but you know, universities are places where you're allowed to blue sky and theorize and et cetera. 
So bear with me if I if I set up my question, but this is just a, and I have a very, very serious question because it, it, it cuts to the heart of what the church is all about in terms of being a living organism, you know, enlivened by the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about the biblical canon, whichever whichever church we belong to, whichever canon we, we have, it's a closed canon, okay? Is the liturgized Bible, which I think is a very legitimate term, as, as, as you point out, does the uh, is is the canon of the liturgized Bible a closed canon? Now, theoretically, I think you and I would agree that it doesn't have to be okay. But we know that de facto, if someone were to come along in our Eastern Christian churches and say, you know. I really feel that I've come up with an amazing set of propers for the, the third the Thursday of the third tone in the Octoyos, because what we see there on that day is, you know, it's kind of like a very sort of boilerplate, stereotypical sort of stuff, you know, because let's face it, not all of that, that inography is equal, you know. So if someone were to want to introduce new hymnography, which theoretically should be possible, how would the church discern that that hymnography is acceptable? Because basically what we have right now is, is basically was, it was a decision made by printers in, in Venice, you know, in the, in the 16th century, okay? So how would we go about discerning that? And then maybe more importantly, because by the way, I'm not suggesting that we should be doing this, because I think that, you know, what we have in the books is pretty decent stuff. But in other churches, they keep on composing hymnography. And we, you're the one that has actually raised the, the problem, because you're very much committed, I think appropriately, to reception, you know, a, a response approach to the scriptures and the reception of the scripture. So presumably the scriptures continue to be received today, and if somebody or someone like yourself who knows the scriptures, knows theology, knows the Father, were to come along and say, I want to introduce a, a, a canon into the Oplodikos, what would be the limits for that? And what would you do to avoid sarmi idiotiki? You know, because remember, before you had hymnography, yes, I'm okay. I'm, I'm going to finish. Anyway, remember that before we had hymnography, the Fathers talked about, you know, sarmi idiotikoi. And the question is, you know, how do you, how would you avoid that um, if, if you were to continue on the, on the response, uh, on the response side? Anyway, yeah. sorry, but you have the man, the liturgist, actually, could <laughs> tell you this, the revisional, you know, stuff, things can be added or whatever. But I'd like to respond to your question about the closed and open canon. Uh, in the Orthodoxy, we know that we didn't have any discussion about canon until, you no. Know, 17th century, the Counter-Reformation, and we are jumping then those discussion about uh, the Catholic Church had the Tridentum, you know, um, uh, Trent, Trent uh, Council, and it's kind of like closed canon. The Orthodox were still operating with Athanasius the Great type of formula, Anaginoscomena. We give these books that status of non-canonical, that the Catholic Church are they were deuterocanonical first, and then they became truly canonical. Um, but we call them non-canonical dash anagenoscomena, readable in the church under the supervision of a bishop. So from the very beginning, we Eastern Orthodox, we are very uh, open-ended type of canon because, uh, you know, you have the anagenoscomena, how many anagenoscomena you can add, you know, later on. If somebody will discover another book and you go to according to the principle of Philo or about the principle of Joseph uh, Flavius, well, Joseph Flavius will go like this, is just a complete canon and you have to demonstrate that everyone in the Old Testament was a canonical writer, was a prophet, or was just in that kind of movement. So the canon is closed there. But Philo says like this, if you have a good wisdom book, 
bring it there. So that was actually for Orthodox, you know, trying to take these books from the Septuagint calling, we call them additions to the Septuagint into the canon. So it's kind of like open, flexible canon kind of from the very beginning. But now we know that all things are so uh, frozen. So you cannot actually add anything, uh, at least in the Eastern Orthodoxy, maybe. My brother knows better if uh, you can add or not some. Uh, I think we will have to continue the discussion informally <laughs> after the end of the official presentation. Um, are there any final questions? Well, I think I would like to thank, first of all, Father Eugene Pentioch for his generosity and his making himself available to fly down from Boston for this. I'd like to thank our graduate students, Samuel Moss, Father Michael Keeler, Kevin Fritz, Jessica Renz, Jonathan Riley, and Philip Moore for engaging with uh, the work of Father Eugene and engaging with him both privately and now publicly. I would like to thank uh, uh, Jonathan Riley and uh, Chris O'Brien for um, uh, help helping coordinate uh, our presentation. I'd like to thank uh, Father George Parsenios from uh, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. I'd like to thank all of you for uh, being here today and um, being present uh, in this wonderful presentation. Um, the Father Eugene's uh, book is available at uh, our bookstore across the street. We've ordered 20 copies. So if you want to buy the book, uh, all you need to go, it's closed right now, tomorrow morning, the following day, go across the street and buy uh, your book. It's uh, highly recommended. Thank you very much. Thank you. Father Eugene. everyone who joined us via Zoom. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. Uh, this presentation uh, will soon be um, uh, posted on the YouTube page of the Institute for the Study of Eastern Christianity. God bless. Have a blessed Holy Week and a blessed Easter. Thank you. <laughs>